Okay, in chapter three, we're going to start talking about um, the bond market, or what sometimes is called the fixed income market. Um, the reason why it's called fixed income is because we're typically talking about um, uh, we're typically talking about um, it providing a, a dividend, a set dividend or interest payment um, over time in a predictable fashion. Now, let's think about who it is that makes loans. So let's just add a page here just before we get into this. Who issues bonds? Primarily we're talking here about companies and governments or government agencies. And what the bond does is it has a um, maturity date. Coupon rate and a purpose. These are some of the, not all of them, but these are some of the essential features of a um, of a bond. So it would say for maturity date, let's say it's a 30 year bond. So then we would say that it matures on February 1st, 2051. That the coupon rate, meaning how much interest are you essentially going to be paid? <laughs> it's going to tell you how often you're going to be paid. So let's just say it's annually. And it's going to pay 4%. And purpose, let's say refi. They're going to refinance loans that were taken on in an earlier time period at a higher interest rate. So then this bond would be issued today, February 1st, and people in the market would then buy this. And they would buy it where they're paying, initially at least, $100 for $100 of bonds. So that's what we have with the initial subscription. But most bonds are actually exchanged, um, a good number of bonds are actually exchanged in the secondary market. So in the secondary market, you're basically reselling the bond. But more often than not, you're not going to sell it at $100 for $100. So in the secondary market, I can't adjust the interest rate. I can't adjust the maturity date. <laughs> I can't do any of these things. All that I can do is offer the next buyer of the bond that already exists. I can offer them either a cheaper price or charge them a higher price than $100 for $100. So in the secondary market, the price matters. Let's look at an example of this in Bloomberg. So this is uh, this one I prepared here. Um, obviously, I didn't. Um, actually, I did know it already. For those of you who had me for class last semester, um, you know, we spent probably about two or three weeks talking about this. Um, <laughs> but Zambia is a country in Africa. It was greatly affected by COVID-19 in various ways. Um, and back in, let's get more detail here. Let's wait for the data to load here. Back in 2015, they had issued um, the bonds. 
And because Zambia bonds don't trade that much, they actually sold it originally for $97 and 97.257 cents on the dollar. So not too much different than 100. They issued $1.25 billion um, in bonds. You had to buy at least $1,000. Um, and the collateral type was this was unsecured, meaning there was nothing backing it up, no construction of something, nothing like that. And in this case, the purpose would be unsecured, meaning they just needed the money. Um, can't fault them for that. <laughs> But here's what the, right, if we go back then and look at it, we can see that back in 2015, well, let's go back further here, but there was a time when it was selling near 97.5. And then even out through 2017, you're getting almost $110. Um, you'd have to pay almost $110 for $100 of this bond. Now, why is that? Let's look at this from a yield perspective. Because back at the time, so the price and the yield move in the opposite direction. Um, the yield is very low for the kind of bond it is. Uh, the bond yield was, I'm going to let me look at it specifically, but it was under 10%. Now, again, the reason why that's not a lot is because this is Zambia. It's an unsecured bond. There's not a lot backing it up. This country could default at any moment, even back in 2017. And <laughs> you get to a point where in 2018, 2019, the country is able to pay this bond, but things are getting harder and harder. And then all of a sudden the pandemic happens. Even strong countries like the US buckled under this. And certainly Zambia doesn't have the finances to keep paying this. And so the interest rate, the effective interest rate for people who held on to these bonds at some point was over 35%. Over 35%, which would mean that your price then gets very, very low. People were willing to spend as little as 30 cents on the dollar to buy this bond. Basically, you're getting a 70% discount. So if you as a buyer of the bond is able to buy $100 of a bond, for only $30, that's the equivalent of like a 35% interest rate. Which is obviously quite a bit. And then you start to see an easing in the global economy throughout the summer, right? And the price does rise a bit because people are really looking for any place to put their money, you've got all this money out there in the market, you got to find some place to start investing things. And then all of a sudden, um, in October, they default. Right? And we're even seeing these kinds of stories right here. Basically, on January 30th, that would be on Saturday, um, Zambia had to make a $56.1 million coupon payment, meaning interest payment, um, for this 2027 bond that we're looking at right now. And it totally didn't do it. Uh, basically, it's like not paying your mortgage or not paying your car loan, meaning they are in default. If not technically, things are pretty bad. So um, what does this mean? It means these bondholders, even for this government bond, they're not going to get back all their money, or at least it's unlikely that they're going to get back all their money. So let's start to look at the lecture now. So 
as we can kind of see here, um, oh, sorry, sorry, let me just do another example of, uh, sorry, and, and that, um, let's just take a standard company. I'm gonna look at a Johnson and Johnson bond here. This would be a Johnson and Johnson bond. Um, as you see here, J&J, the name of the company, two and one fourth, that's the coupon rate, that's the interest rate, matures on September 1st, 2050. So it's all in the top left side here. It was $2 million in bonds. Right now it's selling for about 96 cents on the dollar. It was issued near $100. Um, and this bond was just offered out in um, August 20th of last year in the 30 year bond. Great credit rating, AAA credit rating from Moody's would mean it's probably a pretty pricey um, stock out there um, or bond out there. Um, meaning it's unlikely that this company is going to default. You'll notice here, um, can't focus on it, but right under the price, you'll see SPRD. That means the spread. So what we would do is compare that Johnson and Johnson bond to, it says here 58.5 BP basis points versus T-bill 815-2050. What they're doing there, what Bloomberg is doing there is it's giving you a comparison of how much extra interest rate do you get by buying this Johnson & Johnson bond versus basically a risk-free um, US government treasury that matures at the same time. Basically, you get about half a percent of interest more for buying this riskier bond. So bond, again, written legal argument, contract, promise to repay. Um, you get the interest rate, that's the coupon rate. And um, in the primary market, that's the original amount that was given um, to the bond issuer. And then again, you get the secondary market where the, um, you're then going to, um, we, you're gonna be the new owner of that bond but you're not gonna necessarily pay what the original owner paid because your new basis is gonna be what is the current interest rate environment? What are the prospects of that company? How the price of the bond is determined is determined by its present value of the cash flow. Remember that bond is paying interest payments, a coupon payment, at a certain amount of time at a certain interest rate. And basically all we need to do is we just need to find the present value of those income flows, which we can do by the amount of the payment being in the numerator, <coughs> one plus K being the interest rate that one would receive. And you're gonna do that calculation out for N, time period. So in the equation, you'd have CN plus face over one plus K to the N. CN, that's gonna stand for our coupon payment, number of times it is. <laughs> um, so you're gonna total up all the remaining coupon payments. You're gonna add the face value. You're gonna divide by one plus K taken to the nth power where N is the number of time periods. Um, but you have to discount that again because you need to reflect the fact that you're not receiving it now, you're receiving it in the future. The Again, there's an inverse relationship between the price of the bond and the interest rate. And that's because, right, we see the interest rate in the denominator. So price can only go up when the interest rate goes down. All of this is gonna be determined by 
what's happening in the supply and demand for the market, um, for that bond in the secondary market. So you're going to have the supply curve shifting in and out based on, on the, issuers or the issuers of the bond being willing to offer more bonds. And you're going to have much more so shifting of the demand curve for that bond as people change their interests. So what would be the factors that would cause people to supply more bonds? Um, <laughs> primarily, we're talking about the fact that people are expecting um, that their, the sales of their products are going to go up, or they would expect, um, if, if it's not a business, if it's the government, that they would expect more budget deficits. Um, they have to issue more bonds to cover Right when the government runs a deficit, they don't just print more cash, they have to issue bonds to cover that difference. The 2017 Tax Reform Act passed by former President Trump caused a huge deficit, which then caused a huge increase in the amount of bonds issued. So if supply is going up, then the price of bonds um, is going to be impacted in a negative fashion. Then we've got our demand, that's people being willing to buy these bonds. Even though, right, so if we add a, add something here. If we look at the interest rate on the y-axis, quantity of bonds on the x-axis, we have our demand on the buyer side, we have our supply on the side, this would be the government that's issuing it. So initially, at least, you could say, oh, man, interest rates should have even been lower for these bonds because the supply has gone up so much. And in fact, in Europe, that is what happened. You can buy, I just, just to put some perspective for you here. You can buy a bond here and there's no typo. This is a bond that was issued originally. Sorry for the data here. This was a bond issued on the 27th. So on Thursday, uh, sorry, Wednesday of last week, it's going to mature in 2031. So it's basically a 10 year bond. And the interest rate is zero. Coupon rate zero, meaning no interest. If I wanted to, if I went out there and bought this bond, not only getting 0% interest, but I would have to pay, at least in the current secondary market, $103 for $100. And 10 years from now, when this bond comes due, I'm only going to get $100. Meaning, in Austria, things are so low. Interest rates are so low. The people right now are buying a hundred and paying $103 for a $100 bond. And the bond itself pays no interest. The only benefit it has is that 10 years from now, it'll give you $100. So in that scenario, you lose $3 if you bought it and never sold it, which makes the yield negative. The, the yield is negative 0.3%. Not a huge loss, but still, it's unlike most bonds that we think of. So if you were a global investor and you saw this, you'd be like, why would I want to invest in Austria 
Yes, it's a very safe bond, but I'm losing money here. Yet, I don't want to go and invest in Zambia either. And the consequence of this is that individuals buy U.S. treasuries. And these treasury bills, even for bills, are paying um, very little. But still, the interest rate for this ultra-safe bond that pays zero still is giving you a yield of 0.07%. So it's still positive. So if it's still positive, that I can make more money doing this than elsewhere. So the US has actually been a bright spot in the global financial markets. And you see some of these movements here. I don't need to review for you basic supply and demand, I hope. <laughs> but you, this is how what a bond investor does, is they look for the conditions that are going to affect um, um, the prices. So when we think of, when you think of, when someone says to you that they're a bond investor, they're not just buying bonds and holding them to maturity. They're buying bonds strategically and then they're reselling them when the price has changed sufficiently. Let's go back to our Zambia bond. Zambia. And let's look at who owns it. BlackRock. But the best you got here is you've got a hedge fund that's number three owner. JP Morgan Chase, pretty high up there. Royal Bank of Canada. All of these people here listed, they're not gonna, they don't wanna own this till 2027. That wasn't their intent, at least when they originally bought it. <laughs> they probably would prefer to just be done with this. So Royal Bank of Canada has the Zambia bond in three places. It has it in their Blue Bay Asset Management Company, City National, Roche Dahl, and RBC Global Asset Management. They probably wish they did not have it. Um, if they could sell it, they probably would be happy to get rid of it. Um, looks like City National Rochdale has it in their world, um, their fixed income opportunities fund, 2,105 blocks for total market value of $1.1 million. Again, I don't think they wish they had that. Um, let's see where BlackRock has it. BlackRock has it in three places, Advisors Limited and BlackRock itself. Let's see where they have it in Advisors. So they have it in their global funds. Um, for about four, about half a million dollars. And they have a million dollars through um, R-E-A-L-A. -A. Oh, Ireland. All these people that own it, they're, they're, they're bottom feeders. They're trying to get something really, really cheap. So as you look at all these, there's gonna be a lot of hedge funds. And the only other exceptions to that would be like Japan that the government 
the sovereign wealth fund put it into Zambia, probably for global goodwill or some stuff like that. But you wouldn't want to be buying this if you were a widow or an orphan, because it's not going to exist. It's not going to continue to exist. <laughs> okay. Um, in looking at these factors then too, what you're trying to anticipate is, are investors, are they going to change their behavior towards buying um, these bonds? Um, is there something where people are going to change their attitudes about the future prospects of that government or of that company? Um, do we think that government deficits are going to change and that governments are going to have to issue more bonds, even if at a lower price? Um, how are interest rates as a whole going to change? These are all the things that can shift the demand curve. And just like we can for um, uh, just in general factors, this would be a pretty important chart because this gives us a pretty good idea of whether it affects the demand curve or the supply curve for funds. So the other thing we have going on here is the Fisher effect. And so what the Fisher effect basically says is that um, interest rates, that there's a real interest rate and a nominal interest rate, and that the nominal interest rate is going to equal the real interest rate plus the inflation rate. So what the Fisher effect basically says is that when the interest rate is given to you, there has to be some accommodation, some accounting for how prices are gonna change in the future. What that does is by doing that, by incorporating um, inflation, um, it allows us then to start to think about how bonds are issued um, at different amounts based on how the um, based on how the economy as a whole is doing, meaning that we could have either increased lending because of economic conditions, or we could have reduced lending because the business itself is failing. Okay. Um, that should hopefully give you at least an overview of what's going on in the bond market. Let's just look at one other thing here too. For this class especially, I mean, I'm trying to teach you some of the theory. I'm presuming you already know about bond markets, but even if you don't, you at least have a better idea of what's going on. Let's just look at this. This is the Vanguard Total Bond Market ETF, VND, a pretty popular um, equity. So you could, so it's an equity, meaning you can actually buy this. There's no single bond. What you can do is buy this ETF, exchange traded fund. You could buy this in Robinhood, probably. I don't even, well, maybe you can't, um, but you could definitely buy it in the Vanguard website. Um, ticker symbol would be BND. And with that, you're basically buying part ownership of all of the bonds that Vanguard has in this fund. What is it now? Look at this, the management fee, MNGR fee, incredibly low, 0.04%. This does not cost a lot of money for Vanguard to manage um, this item. And on a one-year basis, it basically has done nothing, which is exactly what you want if you're you know, talking about um, a bond. Even in the worst parts of the market back in um, March, seventy-six cents versus eighty-nine cents. Not very bad. Um, you're getting an interest. You're getting a dividend. It's actually in part the um, interest rate that they're collecting on the various things. But the reason why I wanted to show this to you 
is because I want to. Um, in full disclosure, my wife's, I didn't, I didn't know this, but my wife's firm is actually the top holder. Not my wife's firm, the, the firm that my wife works at is the top holder. Um, I'm curious why that's the case. Where do they own it? Just because they own it for, I'm guessing it's because they own it for clients. So I don't have two point eight billion dollars out there to go buying stuff. I think this one is my wife's four hundred one k, which they manage. I think that's the smaller amount. I think the one above it, I think, is clients, because again, I don't think so these are all the people that own it. This this fund, but that's not what I wanted to look at. I actually wanted to look at. What is in it? Which we can find out here. Maybe not on the app. I might have to be on the big server. Yeah, it looks like it would have to be on the server. Sorry, I'm wasting your time here. Um, let's look at the prospectus they always give us something this would be what you get when you buy a stock most people don't read these I do read them but here I don't want to read it now because I want to just jump to what we want to see Let's do this easier. I'll do it on my computer. Um, looks like their biggest asset is uh, Fannie Mae. So that would mean home mortgage bonds. They, that's 1% of their assets. Treasury bonds, treasury notes, another Fannie Mae bond. Their top four holdings are all government bonds. Now, as I understand it, this fund is not limited to US government bonds. It can actually invest in, yeah. Any investment grade taxable fixed income security, including government, corporate, and international dollar denominated bonds. It just turns out, I guess, in this case, that most of the money to be made is in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bonds as opposed to US Treasury bills. Oh, here we go, maybe. That's okay. Um, okay, so I hope that gives you more of an understanding of what the bond market looks like and some of the interesting, cool things that are going on right now.